We finally got some new insight into what may be next for the developers of Days Gone. Is Days Gone 2 on the way? Is it a new IP? What is their primary focus right now? In our last video, we discussed the numerous reasons why Sony was hesitant to greenlight another Days Gone game. Citing it had a lot of development issues, blew the original budget out of the water, was met with mixed reviews at launch, and had a lack of polish as well for a Sony blockbuster type of title. So no real game is on the horizon, but that didn't stop Sony from greenlighting a Days Gone movie, starring a completely different actor than the video game one. But before we do proceed, do consider dropping a like and also subscribing. We are aiming for 100,000 subs by the end of the year. Every little bit of support does go a long way. But even with all of this information regarding the supposed cancellation of Days Gone 2, it hasn't stopped the community from secretly wishing that Ben Studio was working on something Days Gone related behind the scenes this entire time. Ever since release, there's been this ever-growing support from fans all over the world wishing for Days Gone 2 to come out. I mean, I get hundreds of hundreds of comments comments telling me so. Days Gone indeed made a significant impact on fans of the series and the zombie genre overall. Its immersive world, compelling characters, and intense gameplay, it left a long-lasting impression on players. However, the game's cliffhanger ending left many eagerly anticipating the future of the franchise, and while the cancellation of Days Gone 2 dashed hopes for a direct continuation of the story, there were undoubtedly plans and ideas for where the series could have gone. And we are going to dive into those today while also expressing the new direction Ben Studio as a whole is aiming for, and why it's unlikely that we will see the story in action. Now, everything I'm about to express is coming from a podcast interview from one of the game directors of Days Gone, John Garvin. He was a guest on a Days Gone podcast led by 8-Bit Terror, which honestly, check out their channel and their podcast below. They have such in-depth and a meaningful outlook on this game. They came up with different perspectives and meanings that I personally never thought of. So huge shout out to them. Check out their podcast. It's certainly a good watch. It's a shame that it has such little views, but I'm hopeful that with this community, we can change that. So, the former game director is no longer associated with Sony, having departed some time long ago. In the podcast, he reveals that despite his departure, he conceptualized and documented ideas for Days Gone 2 entirely on his own. His motivation stemmed from a desire to share his creative vision and just maintain his sanity. He outlined his envisioned direction for the franchise, offering insights into what could have been if he had the opportunity to see his vision through to completion. So, Days Gone in his mind was originally pitched as a trilogy. Talking about big ideas, it's like, I never really pitched this to anyone because I didn't want them to think I was crazy because we were having a hard enough time making one game. But I always envisioned the game from the beginning to be a trilogy. It was meant to be a three-part story that intended to deepen both the character's development and the evolution of gameplay mechanics. Notably, the zombies were intended to become more intelligent, suggesting a dynamic shift in the challenges players would face within the game world. He stated that at one point, there was a mission planned in Part 2 where Deacon would be out and about traveling, and he discovers that Freakers now have the ability to possess weapons, clubs, spears, makeshift armor, and also shields. This marks a substantial upgrade from their capabilities depicted in Part 1 of this series. And so he's out on a mission, and then suddenly the Freakers are armed. They have weapons, <laughs> they have clubs and spears, and they have makeshift armor and shields on He also stated that Days Gone 1 one would have been like the initial installment that would kind of resemble something like The Walking Dead, portraying survivors adapting to the new post-apocalyptic world. And then as the story progresses, it delves into increasingly sinister and outlandish themes. Days Gone Part 2 would draw inspiration from Planet of the Apes. This phase would showcase the evolved zombies exerting greater control over society, embracing their newfound abilities to a greater extent. And then for Part 3, the final chapter would be centered around the pure evolution of zombies with Nero emerging as the primary antagonist. Of course, they would have a growing role as time went on, but this installment would be similar to narratives like War of the World or Falling Sky, portraying humanity's struggle against a formidable existential threat. The zombies would undergo societal progression, establishing their roles and community within this post-apocalyptic world. They would be having kids, building up new villages, and continuing with their lives. But at the end of the day, they remain the mortal enemies of humanity. So the second game, the first game, is The Walking Dead, the second game is Planet of the Apes, because you're dealing with a lot of suddenly very smart enemies, and they still want to kill you, And but, you know, you've got to deal with the fact that, you know, they're having kids, and they have small villages of their own, and they're just mortal enemies of, of human beings. Furthermore, the narrative would have continued to center around Deacon and Sarah, with O'Brien retaining a significant role in the storyline. Nero would have been this high-tech enemy that kept reoccurring throughout the series, but on top of all of this, he also mentioned that Sarah would have been 
pregnant while maintaining the goal of also continuing her research. He coined up the possibility that the baby could have been infected and discussed the implications of exactly that. Furthermore, Deacon and Boozer would move the entire Lost Lake camp to the facility showcased in the story, but eventually things would go south with them getting attacked by armed freakers and also Nero. And then, as the narrative progressed, Sarah's research would persist, driving the groups to make the difficult decision to journey towards Western Oregon, which would lead them into more densely populated urban settings and ultimately the coast, expanding the scope of the story and introducing new challenges and environments for the characters to navigate through. Some other minor tidbits were included in here as well. Lisa would play somewhat of an important role in the sequel. Ricky and Addie would have been together. And that's practically everything that would have been showcased in a Days Gone sequel and beyond. The director was very ambitious and knew exactly what direction he wanted to take the story in. I honestly really recommend checking out that podcast. It was from a little bit ago, but after doing my research, literally no one on the internet talked about it or even knew about it. So I was hoping to be the one to bring this conversation forward and get it to as many of you as possible. But again, as we discussed earlier, it's important to clarify that the former lead game director is no longer affiliated with Ben Studio or Sony. His individual conceptualization and documentation of ideas for Days Gone 2 were driven just by his personal desire to share his creative vision. That said, the insights provided from his perspective offer a valuable glimpse into what the sequel could have entailed if he was still at the helm. But that's not really the case here, and it's quite upsetting that we'll never be able to get to see this in action. And I've said this time and time again, but Days Gone 1, it built up a solid foundation, and they really just needed a chance to get a second stab at it to prove themselves further. But unfortunately, the story does kind of get worse, specifically with what's next for Ben Studio. Let me give you a little bit of insight. Back in 2021, we had early reports that Ben Studio was full steam ahead on the development of a new game for Sony, a PlayStation 5 project that was first reported back in 2019. It was claimed by the head of PlayStation at that time that they're building upon the deep open world systems that were developed with Days Gone. They're going to go and further expand their development, focus on what works so well while addressing some other weaker areas. And then fast forward a few years when Ben Studio was actually ready to talk about the project, they detailed that it would have some sort of online open world multiplayer aspect while also subtly stating time and time again that it definitely wasn't connected to Days Gone. And honestly, every time we heard about the project, the team emphasizing the multiplayer component often alluding that online will be playing a much bigger role than originally anticipated. There were also some leaks from a bit ago that suggest this was going to be an open world stealth action game that kind of combines the likeness of Hitman and Metal Gear Solid 5 while also having components of multiplayer and co-op. But then very recently, we started hearing about how deep those multiplayer components actually go. And for all you fans out there that love live service gaming with point shops, outfits, with Nicki Minaj skins, with content that gets drip fed to you over and over for months, I have great news for you. Which this may also be the true final nail in the coffin for any Days Gone related projects in the future, as well as the possibility of single player exclusive projects of any kind coming from Ben Studio. A three decade long legacy brought to a sudden and untimely end. In March of 2024, news broke out of a job listing for a lead project manager position at Ben Studio. According to the listing, the studio is looking for a person with quote, hands-on game development experience and leadership roles shipping AAA live service games. And if you thought that was bad enough, it actually gets much worse. The listing goes on to describe that the potential candidate as someone who has experience redefining studios from traditional box product focused game development into live service development studios in a key leadership role. In case this all comes across as cryptic corporate speak to you, let's break it down a bit, okay? Essentially, Ben Studio is looking to hire someone who can not only help them develop a live service game and put them on the right path, but also someone who can assist in the studio's transition from a single player game development house, which is what it's always been since they released their first game back in 1995, into a studio that may just exclusively develop live service games. You know, the type of games that just keep coming out and flopping one after another. I think I'm more upset that we have yet another game development studio transitioning to live service title. Like going and using Rocksteady as an example, over the years, it's been quite clear that their strengths align with single player story focused games. They were the juggernauts in popularizing the superhero genre in gaming. Rocksteady rose to prominence through their expertise in crafting those immersive single player story driven experiences. Their attention to detail and dedication to narrative excellence have made these games beloved amongst players and critics alike. Rocksteady's success serves as a testament to the power of compelling storytelling in 
and engaging gameplay mechanics and driving the popularity of a franchise. It's their strong suit. But then you have mm. Warner Brothers stepping in and saying, that make a live service suicide squad game a game that just goes directly against their strengths and i'm not saying that this will be the case for ben studio but these are my concerns shifting focus from their forte of single player story driven games to a live service model is quite risky such a transition could potentially undermine the studio's strengths and alienate its core audience who have come to expect high quality narrative experiences developing a live service game it requires a different skill set and approach including ongoing content updates community engagement and long-term player retention strategies. Right now, Rocksteady is struggling like crazy with this transition. I mean, season one was a nightmare. Situations like this have significant consequences for the studio's reputation and even financial performance. Fans may also be disappointed by a departure from the studio's signature style. Additionally, if live service fails to attract and retain players, it could result in a loss of player trust and damage to the studio's brand. Ultimately, while experimenting with new genres and gameplay mechanics can be valuable, valuable for studios, it's essential to consider their strengths and the audience expectations because here's the thing, live service games, they cost so much money and need so many resources put into it. Using Naughty Dog as an example with The Last of Us Factions, when development furthered along, they realized the massive scope of their ambitions and they were at a crossroads. If they wanted to release Factions, they needed to become a solely live service game studio and no longer focus on single player narrative games that have defined Naughty Dog's heritage. They ultimately chose the latter but it seems like Ben Studio here, they chose the former, which mind you, Naughty Dog has around 400 employees and Ben has around 150 as of 2022. But you know, they are hiring. Regardless, a studio with double the numbers of employees needed to transition to a live service studio full time in order for them to reach their ambitions. And honestly, it just seems like it's another one of those instances where developers are chasing trends. I don't know if this was a Sony decision or maybe it was something that Ben truly wanted to craft themselves and deliver on it's kind of unknown but what i can say is that when it comes to live service titles at sony there was a massive push behind them in recent years they originally had 12 live service titles planned to be released by march of 2026 and that number has been sliced in half with some of them being delayed indefinitely or outright canceled and again even a month ago sony canceled even more live service titles when those layoffs came around in the gaming industry one of them was a twisted metal live service game interesting choice it's just a bad look in general that all these major studios they want to hit it big with their next live service title it's the same pursuit over and over that has sunk projects that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to develop like don't get me wrong i love me some democracy that is a live service title that's done right but that's a conversation for another time like i said it's upsetting that another single player focused developer is doing something like this because honestly an open world stealth game like hitman and metal gear solid with multiplayer it does sound awesome but if it's going to be at the cost of the studio no longer focusing on single player narrative games for the future and transitioning solely into a live service developer, I'm not excited. Now, does this job listing spell the definitive end of Days Gone 2 and an uncertain future for Ben Studio as a whole? Yeah, we're, we're f Honestly, jokes aside, no, but it's definitely not good news at all. And this may be me on uh, large amounts of copium being shot into my veins right now. But let's play devil's advocate for a moment. What do we know about Days Gone 2? If you saw our previous video, you'll remember that the co-director of Days Gone stated that their plan for a sequel included a persistent shared open world as well as online cooperative multiplayer. These are allegedly the concepts that they're going to use to build their new, not Days Gone game. It was also mentioned that Days Gone 2 would have had you run into survivors like Deacon trying to build up their safe house and crew? Who's to say that they're not developing all of these online systems and components, testing out what works versus what doesn't in this online stealth game, so that when it comes time for a Days Gone 2, they could perfect it there? Who's to say maybe they are in fact working on a Days Gone 2 this entire time? The only evidence to go against this is that Ben Studio said that the new project will take place in a whole new world in their PlayStation blog post. But couldn't this hypothetical live service Days Gone game take place somewhere outside of Oregon? Maybe even in a different country entirely? Copium, like I said. Of course, this is all speculation. We really don't know much about what Ben Studio is working on, and only time will tell. And with that said, I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.